She was, uh, I think, a modern woman before her time. Mrs. Wright, in my estimation, was a saint, like St. Francis. She really was a kind of an American royalty, and like all royalty, she both uh, gave and she demanded. Very powerful, extremely so. My Lord, what temper she had. I like her and don't like her. I loved her, I hated her, I despised her. I, I had every emotion that, that goes in a human relationship with her. They were human, my grandparents. They were not gods, they were human. He said, what do you know about architecture? Mm. Well, I said, everything. I have been with you 35 years. He was America's most famous and flamboyant architect. She was a smoldering Montenegrin beauty who had fled revolutionary Russia with Bolshevik troops at her heels. Together they wrote a chronicle of ego and tenderness, passion and creativity, scandal and towering artistic achievement unparalleled in this century. He was Frank Lloyd Wright. She was a partner to genius. Hello, I'm Jim Auer, and it's my privilege to introduce you to the most determined, reclusive, mystical, and altogether fascinating woman I've ever met. Her full name, Olga Ivanovna Lazovich Hinzenberg Lloyd Wright. Her friends called her Olga Ivana. The world called her Mrs. Frank Lloyd Wright. Over the 20 years that I knew her, I discovered that she was a queen with two kingdoms, both fashioned by America's undisputed master of organic architecture, Frank Lloyd Wright. The first kingdom, the original Taliesin, is the definitive statement of Wright's early prairie period. It was first occupied in 1911, here in the gently rolling hills near Spring Green in south central Wisconsin. The second kingdom, Taliesin West, was begun in 1938 on 600 boulder and cactus-strewn acres of the Great Maricopa Mesa, northeast of Phoenix, Arizona. From 1925 until her death in 1985, Olgivana Lloyd Wright reigned unquestioned over these two domains. A stately figure, alternately imperious and down-to-earth, she played many roles, lover and organizer, critic and counselor, peacemaker and homemaker. She alone, among Wright's three wives, was able to match wits and creative insights with the tempestuous artistic genius. Together with Wright, she set up a school of architecture that engulfed every aspect of its students' lives. She was a published author of books and newspaper columns. She originated musical themes based on the Slavic melodies of her Montenegrin girlhood. She mounted spectacular dance dramas in the theater at Taliesin West. In concert with Wright, she worked out the color schemes for some of his most famous buildings. And somehow, she found time to serve as a mentor to young architects who came to Taliesin to study and to learn. When I first came to the fellowship and thought of Mrs. Wright as the wisest, most beautiful woman I would ever meet, my Intuition was right. I didn't even know Mrs. Wright existed when I came to the fellowship. I came because of Mr. Wright. I was so enthralled with the beauty of the buildings, and here I saw a person that matched that beauty. The impact of her personality on these young apprentices was enormous. Even greater was her influence on America's foremost architect. In 1924, when they met, Frank Lloyd Wright was an embattled, if not embittered, man. His time of greatness, it seemed, was well behind him. The lyrical, prairie-styled homes, the Larkin Building in Buffalo, the magnificent Roby House in Chicago, the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo, which had survived a catastrophic earthquake, all were in the past. At 57, with his finances flagging, it was obvious to many that Frank Lloyd Wright's career 
had peaked. How it all happened is the heady stuff of romantic fiction. Consider the protagonists. Olgivana Lazovich Hinzenberg, born to aristocratic parents in the tiny principality of Montenegro on December 27, 1898. Her mother was a general in the Montenegrin army. Her father, a Montenegrin Supreme Court justice who had gone blind. And she became his eyes, which means that as a young child, she had to read to him uh, the political papers, the newspapers, the court reports, the philosophers, the, the writers, the literature of the time. Much of my interest in philosophy and literature, and as a matter of fact, in politics, because I had to read the newspapers to him, which I didn't care for, <laughs> came through that influence. When Mrs. Wright was old enough to really start to school, she was sent to live in Russia with her older sister, who had married a, a noble Russian, and they lived uh, in uh, Tiflis. She lived there up until the time of the Russian Revolution. And she got on the last train that left Russia and went to Turkey. And her sister saw her off, and of course she never saw or heard from her sister again. Or, or something that caused her great pain all her life. Mrs. Wright fell in love with the gypsies, thought they were marvelous people. And she went to a gypsy fortune teller who read the tea leaves and said, you're going to go on a long voyage overseas and when you get at the end, the rest of your life will be concerned with squares, circles, and triangles. And when she came to America, she met Frank Lloyd Wright. Now consider the other half of the equation. Frank Lloyd Wright, the gifted, headstrong scion of a clan of sturdy Welsh farmers, the Lloyd Joneses. He was born June 8, 1867, in Richland Center, Wisconsin, and trained briefly at the University of Wisconsin. He enjoyed considerably more success with his early architectural career than with his two failed marriages. In 1909, Wright had left his first wife, Catherine, and their six children in order to set up a new life with his mistress, Mema Borthwick Cheney, the spouse of a former client. The lovers set up housekeeping at Taliesin. And then, on an awful afternoon in 1914, Mema Borthwick, her two children, and four others were murdered. The killer, a demented cook, also set the house afire. Later, unwisely, Wright married an opportunistic poet and mystic, Miriam Noel. They separated after six months, yet she pursued him for years, refusing his pleas for a divorce. It was against this background of soaring ambition and harrowing tragedy that Frank and Olgavana first laid eyes on each other. They met appropriately at the ballet. The place, Chicago, the year, 1924. The chemistry, immediate and as it turned out, long lasting. Olgivana, unhappily married to a Russian architect 10 years her senior, was in the United States with her seven-year-old daughter, Svetlana. Frank, rancorously separated from the possessive Miriam, was seated in the box with several male friends. The way my father and mother met, I think was destiny, although it seems like accident. Frank Lloyd Wright wrote about that moment in his autobiography. A quick, comprehending glance from the young woman with the sensitive, feminine brow and dark eyes. Was she a Russian princess? The glance went home. A strange elation stole over me. They just simply fell deeply in love with each other, almost at first glance. She had never heard of him, never heard his name, rang nothing with her. And Mrs. Wright described it as two magnets, powerful magnets, being drawn together like that. This strange chance meeting was poetry for a man hungry for poetry. My life started then. And he told me, Olgivana, from this time on, you won't be seen for the dust. Hmm. And he was right. The contrast between the two could scarcely have been greater. He, silver-haired and dashing, 
she a darkly ravishing beauty with the soul of a poet and the body of an accomplished dancer. The difference in their ages, 30 years. In their backgrounds, half a globe. In their personalities, oil and water, buckskin and silk. Frank and old Ivana could not marry, so they did the next best thing. They lived together at Taliesin while seeking their respective divorces. Needless to say, tongues wagged in Spring Green. From the very beginning, their alliance was a tempestuous one. Born in scandal, it matured publicly and spectacularly. There were lurid newspaper accounts and unkind jokes. That isn't all his fault. It's also the fault of the people who judged harshly a situation of which he was victim. The wife doesn't give the divorce. What can he do? He loves the woman, so he takes it. With that go all these disagreeable experiences. In 1925, the great house at Taliesin burned again. Later that year, their only child, Jovana, was born, joining Olgivana's daughter, Svetlana, whom Wright would adopt. Through it all, his estranged wife, Miriam, sought to catch the lovers in every snare her lawyers could devise. At one point, the great architect and his high-born companion were jailed overnight like common criminals. The charges were dropped, but the headlines were unforgettable. It meant a very, a very arduous choice for her to make, to live with a man where they could not be married, they had a child, there were four years before they could get married, they were hounded by the press, hounded by the banks, hounded by his former wife. And in my time, I had to win Spring Green and Madison, not everybody rushing out to see what I looked like. But I would go to town, it wasn't pleasant, no. But we couldn't get divorced again. And yet we didn't want to waste a life which we made very constructive here, even without money. They were bankrupt, and yet they both had the feeling of nothing before them except a glorious future, because they had themselves and they had their faith in each other. Frank and Olga Ivana held on, and in 1928, four years after they met, they finally, formally married. She felt the animosity of the Wisconsin population from her very difficult experiences when she first came to Taliesin, whereas in uh, Arizona, they, she moved in a different circle there. People who were more um, liberated themselves, I guess you would say, they were more accepting of her and her life. An idea was germinating. For a second Taliesin in the arid Southwest, far from Wisconsin's chilly winters, and frosty glances. In 1929, Wright was in Arizona working on designs for a resort. Here, outside Phoenix, Olgivana began a lifelong love affair with the desert. As she wrote many years later, we were in terrible financial straits, yet miracles happen to those that have faith. I believed that before long, we could have a home in this beautiful desert. Alas, the stock market crash put an end to the project. Wright moved into writing and lecturing. Then his wife came up with a transformative idea, a school of architecture. The campus, Taliesin itself. She said to him, Frank, all your life you've had hired draftsmen. They come in, they work for you from nine to five, and they go out, and when they're through, they take your ideas and steal them. Why don't you have a school where the people who come in will be like apprentices to you? And I said, uh, you shouldn't leave only buildings behind, you should leave men imbued with an idea of uh, beauty. And uh, he said, well, maybe it is a good idea. So then we got this plan, which we altered as we went along. But finally, the young people came, first just 23. We were hardly finished to house them. They had to carry their own doors still, you know. I said, let them start that way. They are architects. They will know how a building depends on knowledge of mechanics as well as on knowledge of beauty. And their idea was that rather than just sitting 
at an armchair or behind a desk and learning architecture. The architects had to learn something about the materials of the building. They had to learn something about building, actually the building themselves. They had to learn how a building was maintained. So what they found there was really not an educational program as it was an apprenticeship program. The result was a school like no other, encompassing all aspects of the apprentices' lives. Its motto, learning by doing. Young, tuition-paying residents learned how to work. More important, they learned how to learn, designing, drafting, drawing, working with Frank Lloyd Wright. In whatever time was left, they cooked, farmed, tended the animals, repaired existing buildings, constructed new ones. Leavening the hard work were music, dance, literature, and stimulating discussions. Inevitably, they grew as artists and as functioning human beings. That way, we both hoped that will not only make architects, but capable men, men with integrity, men that can uphold the principle no matter what disaster strikes the world, no matter what ideologies might suddenly overwhelm the world. And that is why we had you all participate in our social life, in our music, chamber orchestra, choir, solo work, dance, everything you could think of to develop an individual who is not narrowly looking at one spot with the blinders on his eyes, but that he is completely free, that he can turn in any direction and be able to discern truth. And that was really a remarkable undertaking for two people at that time because it was in the depth of the Depression and there was no work at Talias and so we spent a lot of our time out in the fields and doing thrashing and all the things that one does, gardening and so forth. And in the winter, when the men were busy out in the field in the forest cutting logs, and sometimes we were too, but if there was free time, we were apt to spend it with Mrs. Wright. Formal Saturday evenings allowed apprentices to polish their social skills. After a week of hard work, they donned tuxedos and evening gowns to mingle with noted guests. Mr. Wright always felt that at Taliesin, he wanted a person to be equally at home with a Wisconsin farmer or the Queen of England. And Mrs. Wright was the one who made that possible. I have the feeling that had Franklin Wright been a, a doctor or a lawyer or some other kind of person other than an architect, that there still would have been a fellowship uh, with Mrs. Wright's involvement and that human side of it, that psychological side of it, that, that demand of performance and commitment would have been the same. And that the fact that this place had to do with architecture was really almost secondary in her focus. The working of the fellowship was more Olgivana Wright's responsibility than her husband's. Indeed, with its stress on personal development and hands-on training, the fellowship took its cue directly from her own experiences a decade and a half earlier with her mentor, G.I. Gurdjieff. He was like the sun, Mr. Gurdjieff. When he came into a room, say there were lots of people in the room, he came in, it was just as if the sun rose. He had about him a certain emanation or radiation, I suppose you would say, of goodness, power, and understanding. Georgi Ivanovich Gurdjieff was born on the Russian-Turkish border to a Greek father and an Armenian mother. Erudite, magnetic, opinionated, he was a philosopher who transfixed and controlled his followers. His curriculum was rigorous, employing dance, exercise, sacrifice, physical labor, and psychological discipline. These practices had an enormous impact on his loyal student, Olga Vana, who had joined in 1917. His school was called the Harmonious Development for Man, and it believed that you develop man's mind, you develop the heart, and you develop the body all the time, same time, to produce a complete person. It seemed almost like fate that she and Gurdjieff met because 
if she hadn't met him, I don't know if she would have been exactly who she was later. I think if you read about Gurdjieff's life, uh, you're not quite sure whether he was a, a savior or a monster. He was strong and strict and a person who resisted change. In Mrs. Wright, he found someone who was very flexible. And when I went there, Gurdjieff was very kind and told me that I had unusual depth of understanding, but I needed worldliness. When she first met him, when she first saw him, she knew she had found a philosopher that could help her. And he said, what do you want in life? And she said, immortality. Ho, ho, ho. He said, that's, that's not passed on the platter. For that, you struggle and you suffer. And she did that. She went with him for seven years. One time he, he made her walk across the desert. She had street shoes on, and he made her walk in her shoes across the stones and everything, and her feet were hurting or bleeding. And she said to him, why are you doing this to me? He said, that's the first time you've worked for a meal in your life, and I want to make you strong. She would go through anything then. She believed him utterly. I mean, she was a, a classic disciple in that way. Mrs. Wright was frail in physically, but very strong in spirit. And she could go along and stand anything. In the Institute, I did all those things that I knew nothing about. He was absolutely wonderful to supply me with the things that counted, he said, only if they are related in some way to you. Theories are nothing. Throw them all out. In a sense, she did not mimic Gurdjieff, but she, her whole uh, outlook on life was filled with the similar type philosophy. And basically what it amounted to was, I can't do anything for you, you've got to do it for yourself. And one time she said, what will become of you when something happens to me? I was so struck, I said, what? Nothing wrong will happen to me. I have it all inside here. I can do anything, I can go wash the dishes, I can go dig the ditches, I can go to cook, I can go to teach dance, I can go to speak to them. And he just turned his head away, please. Gurdjieff said, it is time for you to leave. You've been with me seven years. You've learned just about all you can from me. You need to go to America and start a school. I think it is absolutely amazing that a few years later she meets Frank Lloyd Wright. A few years later there is the evolution of the Taliesin Fellowship. What was beautifully formulated was, was a school that dealt with the principles of building a person from the ground up that was not perceived as being esoteric but was based in common sense. That is why he decided to have Taliesin Fellowship. It started long ago, I believe in 1932. And the philosophy that went with it was potent philosophy because it had this principle of continuity. And in order to maintain that principle, it had to be accompanied by action. No idleness was permitted at Talies. No leisure that was not a constructive leisure. And the hard work struck the young people the first day they put their foot on Talies. The effects of the Great Depression were felt keenly at Taliesin. With clients scarce and cash even scarcer, the students proved enormously useful, as did their tuition checks. Olgivana's philosophy, honed through her long, arduous apprenticeship with Gurdjieff, helped her to survive these hardest of hard times. The depression was such that Mrs. Wright had no money to buy 
uh, dresses for her girls, Svetlana and Ivana, and she used the pongee curtains and made dresses from the pongee curtains that were in the living room. Through it all, Taliesin remained vibrant, dynamic, alive. Jenkin Lloyd-Jones, a distant relative of Wright's, wrote many years later, but Taliesin was no house of a busted genius. There was a brave illusion of opulence. However sparse the supper, vases were ablaze with summer flowers, or in wintertime with pussy willows and bittersweet. Tables were loaded with bowls of red apples from the orchard on the hill. This was all Gavana's doing. However bare the cupboard, she was born with a touch of richness. Both Mr. and Mrs. Wright had a sort of a, sim a similar feeling about finances, which was certainly very radical, certainly very unconventional. And they spent most of their life in debt or very close to the margin because they bought beautiful things, and those are the things which are important to them. One time, Mrs. Wright came into the living room and said, Well, Frank, how much money do we have in all? Just what I have in my pocket. I took out this. Is no banking up. This is in my pocket. Spend it, she said, so we'll get some more. They went out, spent it, and the next morning came a letter from Kaufman to design Falling Water. Falling Water in Pennsylvania signaled a renaissance in Wright's fortunes. Suddenly, he began to do great architecture again. In his words, ideas were spilling out of his sleeve and onto the paper. Finally, Mrs. Wright's dream of a desert home could come true. All of that was a result of the combination of the chemistry of Frank Lloyd Wright and Olga von Lloyd Wright. I think it was the general stimulation of a younger woman for a, an older man. Uh, she kept him alive. I think that uh, she, his most creative period began almost, uh, you can almost date it with their courtship and so forth. Mrs. Wright gave Mr. Wright uh, an energy to go from prose to poetry. Mrs. Wright started to enter into Mr. Wright's life and his architecture became softer, more feminine. The curve in the circle began to enter more and more into the plan and into the elevation. And it was then that Mr. Wright started to use the terms that were natural. So what Mrs. Wright did was make his work humane. She was aware of the fact that his genius lay in his power of absorption. You present a good idea to him and you absorb it. A very simple example, a very uh, basic example of it, is when they were walking one day in Wisconsin between Hillside and Taliesin, two of our buildings. And Mrs. Wright said, look, Frank, look at those cows. They look like crumpled up newspapers on the landscape, black and white. And he said, well, Holstein's the best milk cow there is. He, he was always a farmer, born and raised a farmer, he loved farming. But she said, think how wonderful the Guernseys would look that Titian red, that chestnut red on that beautiful green. No, he said, they can't compare to the Holsteins. The next day he went to the Farm Bureau and made an arrangement to sell the Guernseys and sell the Holsteins and buy the Guernseys. And someone said, well, how come you're selling up all your Holsteins and switching over to the Guernseys? Well, said Mr. Wright, it occurred to me the other day that the Holsteins just like, looked like crumpled up newspapers on the landscape. Now, it's not that he was forgetting the idea came from her or belittling her or taking the credit away from her. What he was doing was absorbing what he thought was a good idea. And she, knowing that, could feed him the ideas. Mrs. Wright influenced Mr. Wright a great deal in many ways, but one of them was in the, the type of color that he used. She had a remarkable sense of color. And whereas Mr. Wright had used very neutral colors, generally speaking, she introduced quite a bit of color into the house, which Mr. Wright found very welcome. And he asked her advice when he was building buildings, and she would help with the color schemes of the buildings. Her first mission in her life, she said, was his health, to make sure that he was ate well, that he slept well, that he exercised well and also to surround him with people, of, with, with people and with an environment which would be conducive to a creative life. And she said in relation to that, she said, you know, Bruce, I ruled him, but I ruled him with love. Mr. Wright was an architect of buildings and Mrs. Wright was an architect of men. And the combination of the two produced an extraordinary architectural school. Mrs. Wright really became 
uh, not only my teacher, be, she became my friend, uh, uh, she really became my mother. Practically everything I know about life, I learned from her. You would be doing things you'd never dreamed of doing, from upholstering chairs to cooking to, I mean, I always cooked, but not for so many people, and dance and music. I think if you know one thing very well, deeply, many, myriads of aspects, one thing, whatever it is, even cooking, even cleaning the house, even washing the laundry, when you know something very well, you get hold of the principle, the interior principle, then you can do anything else you wish to do, and it will be good. Many times even a deep kind of revelation can occur in a very common, ordinary event. She could sense uncannily where a person was, you know, who they were at their core, what they needed, where their weakness was, where their strength was, what kind of person they were. And she studied everybody and, and really decided how she could help them improve to mold the people who were here into more interesting personalities, I would say. She invited me for dinner and there were all these people around and I hardly spoke at all. I was so terrified, really, that I hardly said a word during the whole dinner and she was, next day she called me in and she, she was very angry with me and she said, you can't do that. You can't accept the dinner invitation, come to dinner and not say a word. <laughs> you know? I felt so terrible about that. Everyone who knew Mrs. Wright had their own personal relationship. It was something only known between Mrs. Wright and that person. And that is the way she talked. I mean, you simply, every conversation was a confidential conversation, not, not in terms of secrecy, but just in terms of meaning and purpose and intensity. I mean, you, many people go through life never having one conversation, uh, the kind of which one had with her at every meeting. If you were not seeing something, she was quite capable of waking you up. And sometimes if that was uh, done in a gentle way, it was done in a gentle way. If it, if it couldn't be done in a gentle way, it was done in a harsh way. She often, uh, often would, would, would press me to, to get angry. You would work and give your all and then have Mrs. Wright say, you know, why are you holding back? She could deliver a blow but so gracefully <laughs> that, you know, you, you would be just torn to pieces. I mean, you would feel like you were completely defenseless and helpless. And then the next, in the next few minutes, she would repair you, you know, put you, take the pieces and put them back together, and you were whole again. And it felt so good that you, <laughs> you, know, you forgot to be angry. I saw her with tremendous uh, force. But uh, Mrs. Wright, you know, could put it on and uh, if she needed to use it, she was a wonderful actress. I mean, she would put it on uh, without it affecting her, but the result for somebody else was, was something frightful. Some may have been at times deeply challenged, even hurt, may have felt more attacked than they might have from other acquaintances. But at the deepest level, I don't believe there's anyone who wouldn't have to acknowledge that there was a powerful sense of love that came from her. There's no such thing as an ordinary man. And at first, maybe you can say how everybody looks alike, but you know them. A little more, you know, there is individuality there, but it's stuck in deep somewhere. You have to pull it out because it's covered with conventions. She was a a master of relationships. She, she knew how things went together and, and for her virtually all problems, be they financial or structural or uh, scientific, they were all human problems. She understood power. She always wanted to be at the center of things, often at the expense of not allowing people to, 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 be, uh, to have a part of it. Uh, she wanted always to be a third party to every relationship of two. She felt she can always improve a situation by being a third party to it. I think
think there was a conflict between the, f the immediate family and the larger family of Taliesin. And um, I think often that my grandparents chose to deal with the larger family and whatever problems there might be there rather than the immediate one of my mother, really, and then her sister Svetlana, who, who died uh, later on. My mother resented it and, and felt angry about it, that her parents were not uh, always there for her. They had other things to do. My first memory of my mother is giving me a bath in the big room, in the big bathroom with the sunlight tub. I was about three years old. She lifted me out and then she dried me and she said, are you my little body? Are you my little soul? My mother was an extraordinary, is an extraordinary woman and very gifted and very brilliant and was quite beautiful. And you know, you get three people <laughs> with similar um, talents like that, similar qualities, and you've got, you've got a difficult situation, you know. It's not your regular nuclear American family. You see, my father had a terribly jealous nature. He was violently jealous. It wasn't a, a, a peaceful, easy relationship with, a, with no struggle all those years. Mr. Wright was a strong man and she was a strong woman and they were equal. Once when poor mother tried to learn the cello and was practicing, he was violently against it. He said to me, oh, listen to that poor woman try to play the cello and the terrible sound she makes. So poor mother had to stop the cello. It seemed that both my grandparents provoked very strong responses in people, and so did my mother. They differed greatly. Uh, mother, of course, had been schooled by Mr. Gajif to repress negative emotions, for example, not on certain occasions to show temper, to abide by life. My father hadn't been schooled in such a way. She pushed people all the time. She pushed them to their extremes all the time. And that's a difficult way to live. But he could also be pretty calm, pretty tough too. And usually harder on the people closer to him. They loved each other so much and yet they fought a lot. They fought an awful lot. They even fought over me. There was no family who was closer knit than the four of us, my mother and father and sister and I. Svetlana, the older daughter, was married to Taliesin architect William Wesley Peters. They had two sons. Svetlana died so suddenly when she was 29. Without a doubt, the most traumatic loss ever suffered by Olga Ivana Lloyd Wright took place in the summer of 1946. It was the untimely death in an auto crash of her older daughter, Svetlana. She lost control of the Jeep on her way from Taliesin to Spring Green, and it flipped over. Svetlana was killed, along with two-year-old Daniel and her unborn child. Only Brandock survived. I was fixing up Mrs. Wright's room when she came in the door and she said, go away, go away. And she burst out crying. And of course I was too. <laughs> so sad. Terribly sad. I would try to figure it out. Why did it, ha why do things like that happen? Why? And I never receive an answer. Many years later, Mrs. Wright remembered how her husband had helped her to cope with this ultimate tragedy. He said, don't stay still a minute. Come, we will go in the living room. 
was Sunday, come out, start immediately, don't stop, keep working, you'll come out of it. It was very hard then too, but I took that upon myself, don't stop, you must pick this up right away, put your arms under it, carry on now, no matter what, go, move. And that's where he helped me in the very difficult first years. Mrs. Wright, after Svetlana's death, was so unhappy and lived such an inner life that she couldn't break out of it. And she gave up jewelry, makeup, meat, alcohol, and coffee for five years. And after five years, that was the time when she really completely came back to us. The impact of Svetlana's death on the Wright household was immeasurable. Mrs. Wright put it this way in her book, Our House. Since the tragic loss of our daughter Svetlana, the consequences of the blow are still in existence here at Taliesin. Memories live not only within us, but in the very songs of birds and the swaying branches of pine trees and birches and in the fragrance of blossoms. These are the traces of our living sorrow that the flow of time cannot erase. The tragedy sparked an explosion of creative energy. She wrote books, she composed music, and she collaborated with Yovana on the Taliesin festivals of music and dance. These exotic multimedia presentations were not, however, without their difficulties. The festivals of music and dance, like everything else at Taliesin, were extremely demanding. Lots of screaming and criticizing and name calling great deal of agony in putting it all together. The Fellowship's white-haired patriarch had erected a pavilion at Taliesin West as a home for the music and dance spectaculars, but still he couldn't suppress an occasional pang of jealousy when he saw the spotlight swinging to his wife and daughter. Coping with his outbursts was a major test for Olgivana's powers of diplomacy. In her memoirs, she wrote candidly about her husband's jealousy but she also wrote about the philosophy that enabled her to cope with it. The way is difficult, she wrote, but the aim sublime. Suffering endured in behalf of a great cause ennobles the spirit. Well, it's philosophy applied to life, not an abstract philosophy, but I believe that whatever philosophy or whatever thoughts or whatever thinking processes we possess, we should instantly transmit into life. She would write a chapter and then call in several of us, or one at a time, and she would read it to us, or we would read it out loud to her to get that feeling of how it came across from the printed page to others. Her weekly newspaper columns chronicled everyday life at Taliesin. The more intimate details of her marriage she reserved for her unpublished memoirs. Here, a warmer, more passionate picture of their relationship emerged, one in which a Strauss waltz played on the radio could end in lovemaking. I can never forget, she wrote, the way he suddenly swished his cape and swept me with it in a way so masculinely beautiful. And holding me in his arms, he started to waltz, which ended in the most beautiful culmination of two people together. I was in love with him and he with me until the last. Father always wore an amethyst cross at Easter, wore it on a white dress. My father would wear a white suit with his hat and cane, white shoes, everything. He looked very, very tired that last Easter. Very tired. And he didn't want to die. He wanted to live. He wanted to continue. But 
evidently the thing we call fate ordained otherwise. Frank Lloyd Wright had lived so long and so vigorously that some of those around him had come to consider him almost immortal. His death on April 9th, 1959, almost on the eve of his 92nd birthday, hence came as an enormous shock. He was buried here in the family cemetery at Spring Green in Wisconsin. Oh, Mrs. Wright was devastated by Mr. Wright's death. In essence, she said, I don't think I can go on without him. I mean, she was totally drained. I mean, she almost didn't look like a person and still sat there with great strength talking about the fact that everything would be okay. She dealt well with it on a, on a worldly sense uh, in that here, was, here she was faced with a, a business, a world famous name, uh, 75 apprentices. That, in that way, she took it uh, like a true soldier. Personally, it was a devastating blow to her. I don't think to her dying day that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright ever left her. So it made me feel happy when I drove over the hill and looking at the same green hills as I did with Mr. Wright coming here for some 30 years to hear him speak at first and I continuing it now. She was now the leader and the responsible one for all that group of people which was immense and immense problems. Uh, there, was, there were financial problems after Mr. Wright's death. There were uh, personality and psychological and philosophical questions that had to be answered. Mrs. Wright went right into it without any uh, hesitation. Could the Wright Fellowship outlive its founder? Cynics predicted it wouldn't last six months. Olga Ivana knew in her heart that it would survive. She vowed to carry on the school and to see her husband's projects through to completion. Now he left men behind and he left me behind with absolute assurance that his work will not die. Mrs. Wright turned to the composition of music as a creative outlet and for solace. It was to her, I think, a very much of a expression of her soul, her spirit. It's very hard to perform. In fact, I'd say it's extraordinarily difficult to perform because uh, the notes are not the music. Her music, really, you have to know that spirit behind it. Mrs. Wright conceived music in a very linear way. She, she thought of melodies, and in general, they, they are somewhat haunting. I think they have definitely a very um, Slavic touch to it. Her method of composing, when she started, was to sing it into a tape recorder. So I would take it and transcribe it, and begin to work with it to get the kind of harmony she wanted. It became a language which she and I could communicate. It was such a parallel with Mr. Wright, because he would bring us in the morning a little sketch, and we'd have to make a house out of it. And Mrs. Wright was very much the same with her music. Uh, the little sketch that she would hum, uh, and she would tell Bruce something about what kind of harmony it should have. Bruce would try to harmonize it and put it together, but if it really wasn't what she had in mind, it would get changed. She had a very clear idea of what she really wanted in spirit, but the technique was, she was not a professional musician in that sense. A more dramatic use of Mrs. Wright's compositions came in the dance dramas. Here, her vision meshed with that of her daughter, Giovanna. Nothing is lost in the stars, so learn your fate from the all-powerful heavens. It is they who dictate the 
petty destinies of men. Uh, you have to attribute an enormous amount of the beauty of what was on stage to Yovana. Yovana was the, was the choreographer and basically the idea of the, the whole show. I would outline the story to her and give her the basic idea and the basic steps and gestures and then she would compose the music. It was an incredible way the two worked, but it was not always, uh, I wouldn't say they were always completely happy. It was, a, it was 10 of the most glorious years of my life working on her music, from about 1961 to 71. And she didn't do very much music after that. I actually, we, I probably have 50 or 100 hours of her recorder I haven't transcribed yet. Through the 1970s, commissions continued to flow in. And, though increasingly infirm, Mrs. Wright continued to lecture, entertain, and travel. It was a brave facade. But those who knew her well were concerned. Things began to get shaky for her. She told me one day, Brandock, you won't tell anyone what's happening here. And I said, you know, you know there isn't anything happening here, but to her, there was. And she wasn't in command of her own faculties as much as she used to be. When was the last time you saw your mother? It was in 1983, April, April 14th, 1983. And she already, the cataracts had grown quite thickly on her eyes and she had a difficult time seeing me. But then toward the very end, I came in to announce lunch, and that's when she was really blind. I came in to announce lunch. And I said, Mrs. Wright, it's lunchtime. I tapped her on the knee. She's sitting in a chair. We had lunch and dinner. It doesn't matter. It's all darkness now. The penalties of great age had taken their toll. At 3 a.m. on a warm March morning in 1985, Olga Vanna Lloyd Wright died at a Scottsdale hospital. The fellowship said goodbye in characteristic fashion. Wrote Edgar Toffel, a former apprentice who had returned for the rights. The living room was full of flowers and chairs. The casket was set at a 60 degree angle from the fireplace, the upper half open and draped in Cherokee red velour. Effie Casey played the violin from Mrs. Wright's Sonata as Bruce Brooks Pfeiffer accompanied her at the piano. One final surprise remained. Upon her death, Mrs. Wright's long-held request was fulfilled. Her husband's remains were removed from the family graveyard in Spring Green and taken to Taliesin West. There they were cremated and reburied with hers. He belongs in Arizona because they appreciated him they admired him. The shock waves reached from Scottsdale to Madison. Wisconsin's newspapers were agog. The state legislature objected to the removal of its most famous son from Wisconsin soil, but it was too late. Olga Vanna and Frank Lloyd Wright were together again. Their shared resting spot is unmarked, but it is suffused with the brilliant color of desert blossoms. Olga. Ivanovna, Lazovich, Hinzenberg, Lloyd Wright. Poet, mystic, pragmatist, wrapped in the guise of a fascinating Serbian-accented artist. Partner to the genius of Frank Lloyd Wright, she was the force behind the Taliesin Fellowship, holding it together with brains, blood, sheer psychic energy. I visited Mrs. Wright many times during her later years, and always I came away with a sense of spiritual sustenance. When the musicians played her sonatas, when Bruce Brooks Pfeiffer stood behind her at dinner holding a tiny silver pillbox, it was another world. It was magic. She spent 60 long, difficult years as Taliesin's uncrowned queen, many of them in glamorous poverty. Out of it she emerged, not hard, but wise. 
Mrs. Wright said to me in that intense yet intimate way of hers, something I've never forgotten. When I meet my husband again, I will be able to look him in the eye because I will have kept his name alive. In a very real sense, she was writing her own epitaph and she knew it. This is PBS.